In this chapter, we will read about tertiary and quaternary activities. Now, when I say this, my direct question is, what is the meaning of the words tertiary and quaternary? Tertiary means third phase. So the first phase of any nation's economy is always primary activities like agriculture, mining, animal husbandry, fishing, etc. And the second phase is industries like manufacturing, processing, and construction, which we call it as secondary activities. And after that, we have tertiary. And quaternary is the next phase after tertiary, that is the fourth phase. We usually put tertiary and quaternary phase together because they have a lot of similarities and we will read about them as we go further. That's why this chapter has both the terms together. Alright then, that was the introduction part. Now let's jump into the book and let's get started. Tertiary activities are related to the service sector. What do we mean by that? In primary and secondary activities, you will notice there is a product that is created and then it goes through a development phase before going into the market. In tertiary, what happens is, you have services rather than a product. For example, you go to tuition, you pay fees in return of knowledge. Hence the knowledge that you're getting is the service of that coaching center and that makes it a tertiary activity. Similarly, government gives services. They never give you a product. I mean, there are few state governments who give TVs, ACs, computers, cycles, etc. We are not counting that, they are something else. So government usually gives services like security, infrastructure, policies, welfare, help, etc. So the moment you provide any service, you fall in the tertiary activities or service sector. Now when you get a service, you want it to be perfect or up to the mark which benefits in some way. And for that, the service provider or the giver should be a skilled labor, a professional expert in so and so particular field that you are looking for. So all these qualities like skilled labor, professional expertise, consultant, these are very important components or you can say qualities of the tertiary activities. Here you can see some of the examples of tertiary activities which are the work of a plumber, electrician, technician, launderer, barber, shopkeeper, driver, cashier, teacher, doctor, lawyer, publisher, etc. Now let's get to know the types of tertiary activities. I just want you to remember this chapter is going to go in depth of this topic, so gear up. If you look at this chart, it shows the basic classification of all the tertiary as well as quaternary activities. You will see trade, transport, communication and services are some of the well-known tertiary activities. Let's understand each of the subcategories of tertiary activities. The first one is trade and commerce. Trade basically means buying and selling of items that are produced in totally different locations. And they are usually intended for profit, meaning if you are selling a product that is the selling price which is the SP of an item has to be more than the cost price that is the CP of that item. So this kind of work takes place in towns and cities and that's why we call them trading centers. Trade and commerce is divided into wholesale trade and retail trade. Under wholesale trade, the trading centers are divided into rural and urban marketing centers. And you can figure out the differences easily. Rural marketing centers supports the rural side of the society. The RMC that is the rural marketing centers are quasi urban centers, meaning they are almost like an urban center, but not completely an urban center. Some of its characteristic traits matches with the urban center, like in terms of their functioning and processes. But the professional services are not well developed. One example would be a vegetable mandi or market. You must have seen how the vendors sit on the sidewalks selling vegetables. It's quick, cheaper and there is no proper infrastructure. All they care is selling and finishing the stock. And you will also find these type of mandis on markets functioning once or twice in a week. Hence, people buy vegetables on weekly stock basis and then these markets also move from one place to another. If today they are at place A, after two days they will be at place B. So this is what is rural marketing center. Coming to the urban marketing centers, they have more widely specialized urban services because the urban people have more demands compared to rural people. Since UMC, the urban marketing center, they serve purely the urban crowd, hence their services has to be wide. We are talking about educational services, teachers, lawyers, consultants, physicians, dentists, veterinary doctors, etc. You'll find all these services available in a city but it's difficult to find them in a rural area. Of course, these days things are changing due to various development schemes, but you know what I'm saying, so you can understand the differentiation between a rural marketing center and an urban marketing center. Now let's read about retail trading services. So what is the meaning of the word retail? 
You must have heard about retail supermarkets, retail stores, etc. It means selling goods to public in small quantities. You cannot buy bulk products because that would actually mean you will go on to sell it and create your own business. Retail services give limited quantity of products for use or consumption rather than reselling. So if you look at here, most of the retail trading take place in a fixed establishment or stores. That means you need to have a store or a place where you can sell products. When you go for buying clothes, you go to a store, right? That's a retail store. I hope you're getting the meaning of retail trading services. Now the next one is wholesale trading service. Always remember wholesale means bulk, where you have to buy products in bulk. You cannot buy a few units. It has to be a fairly large number of units, depending on the things that you're buying. A good example would be Alibaba.com. I don't know if you have heard about this or not. You can go to the website and check it. It's an online wholesale trading website. When you look at any product in this website, next to it, you can see the minimum quantity information, which is usually 100 to 1000 units. Again, depending on products. So this is a good example of wholesale trading service. Another important aspect about wholesale trading service is that if you and I wanted to start a business tomorrow, we can acquire goods from these wholesale trading centers and keep them in a personal retail store and then sell it to the customers directly. Hence, what I mean is if I were to put it in order on top, we have wholesale traders and below we have retail traders. So this is the differentiation between wholesale and retail trading services. We now move on to the next type of tertiary activity that is transport and communication services. We all know the importance of transport in a business as well as in our personal lives. Modern society requires a speedy and efficient transport system to assist in the production, distribution and consumption of goods. This is so true. In order to feed the growing consumer's need, transport is very crucial. Just think about it. There are so many perishable good that needs to be delivered to a certain place on time. Otherwise, there's a huge loss associated with it. So you see profit and loss is very much associated with transport. Hence, the longer the distance, the higher the cost as well as which mode of transportation you choose also determines the cost. I mean, aeroplane is any day expensive than train or ship because of its delivery time. So I hope you understand the cost distance relationship. Now we are going to read about factors affecting transport services. So there are two things affect transportation. One is demand and the other one is routes. Suppose if there is no demand at a particular place, you can imagine this with anything. You know, keep any product or service and just imagine if there is no demand for that product at a particular place. There will be no sale, hence there will be no supply. And if there is no supply, then there is no need for transportation. As simple as that. So the larger the population size, the greater is the demand of transport. Now coming to routes, it's easy to understand this. If there is no road, how will the big trucks, trains and transport mediums going to travel for delivery? I think you can understand that easily. That's why you see most of the hilly areas of north and northeastern side of India has very less train tracks because of rough hilly terrain. And due to that, railways is not developed in those regions. So that's the importance of routes for an effective transportation. Now we go to the next topic, communication services. The word communication has to do with words and messages, facts and ideas. Your phone is an ideal device for communication. Your mind is a perfect organ to create ideas and your mouth and hands expresses them elegantly. So if you see traditionally and even now, hands, animal, boat, road, rail and air are used to deliver messages. And these are called lines of communication. That means communication used to be dependent on transportation. But today, with the help of mobile, telephone and satellites, communication is independent of transport, meaning you can send a quick message, picture, video without any sort of traditional transport medium. Now some of the communication services are radio, television, newspaper, telephone, internet, mass media, etc. Coming to the next activity under tertiary activity is services. Now understand this, there are two recipients or receivers of services. The first one is an individual customer like you and I. We all need services like teaching services, medical services, barber, lawyer, physician, musician, etc. And the second receiver is an industry. Now industry means a particular sector. It's a broad category which involves everything like consultancy is a service which caters to individuals who are looking for jobs. Then it also caters to big companies that need people for doing their work. Now there are certain services which are regulated. 
meaning controlled or maintained by an authority like a government or a company. These services are making and maintaining highways, bridges, guarding national borders, firefighting departments, law and order by police and military, land allocation, health services, water and electricity services, then education and many other services. So for all of this, government has separate bodies and institutions that looks into these services and their functions. These services are a matter of national importance in terms of growth, revenue and social well-being. So they cannot be given to anyone. That's why government keeps it to themselves for its better functioning. They very carefully give these services to private institutions. Now we are going to read about informal, non-formal sector. This sector of the economy is also known as grey economy, meaning they are neither taxed nor monitored by any form of government. And they are also not included in the gross national product that is the GNP and gross domestic product that is the GDP of a country. So the workers in this sector are unskilled and most of them migrate from rural to urban areas doing jobs like housekeeping, cooking, gardening etc. If at all you have a housekeeper or a cook in your house and you pay them monthly salary and if you see they don't pay taxes. In economic term they are basically known as free riders who yield the benefits of others who contribute in the tax money. Hence this sector of people are called informal sector or non-formal sector or unorganized sector. Let's go to the next topic, people engaged in tertiary activities. As we have read before, tertiary activities are also called service sectors. Today most of the workers are service workers and in developed countries, this percentage is more, much more than developing countries, meaning there are more service workers in countries like USA, UK, France, Europe, etc. And one main reason is due to their large population of skilled labors. The more skills you have, usually you will find them in service sectors and also with time, employment in this sector is increasing like anything. We will now look at the tourism industry which is a tertiary activity and let's try to understand this department. So tourism is a business based on travel and recreational activities and if you see, because of tourism a lot of other activities benefit. I'm talking about hotel industries, transport, food and entertainment industries. These all are directly and indirectly dependent on tourism. Now let's look at some tourist regions. The warmer places around the Mediterranean coast and the west coast of India are some of the popular tourist destinations in the world. And then there are activities like winter sport, mountaineering, trekking, sightseeing, cultural landscape, all these activities attract tourists. So places that have these activities going on, they benefit a lot out of tourism. Now let's look at the factors affecting tourism. First one is demand. Now tourism is a leisure time. I think we all can agree on that. Hence if people don't have time for leisure or if there isn't any demand for holidays then tourism industry is going to suffer badly. I hope you're understanding the link. The second factor is transport. When we say transport we mean transport facilities like road, vehicles etc. Now imagine this. Holidays are limited. You will probably have some days to enjoy. Now you don't want to spend those few days just traveling and trying to reach your destination. For example, plane reduces the time tremendously to reach anywhere in the world. And plane is one of the mode of transport. So you see how important transport is for tourism. Now we will quickly read about tourist attractions. I mean what really attracts a tourist? I think it's fairly simple to understand. I mean you all can relate to it. So let's quickly go through each one of them in brief. The first one is climate. You will love to go to a place that has a good climate like warm sunny weather, long hours of sunshine and low rainfall. That's why Mediterranean climate offers the best location for tourism. The second one is landscape. Again you would love to go to a place that has a nice view of mountains, lakes, spectacular sea coasts and landscapes. So landscape is something that attracts a tourist. The third one is history and art. Places that has historical evidence then archaeological sites these places attracts a lot of tourists and it is usually because people are curious to know how human society evolved with time. And the fourth one is culture and economy. So it's always good to know other cultures, right? And what can be better if the place is economically cheap to travel? Wouldn't that be nice to experience such a place? So culture and economy of a place definitely attracts a tourist. So these were the four important points that goes on in the mind of a traveler. Now we move to a different topic called empowered workers. The meaning of empower is to give power to do something. So workers that are given power or confidence to do something is what we are going to read here. 
So today you will find many people walking the path of an entrepreneur. They say there is a lot of risk in running your own business. You may fail terribly. Despite that, people are going forward. Now that is what the meaning is when we say empowered workers. These workers are those workers who do work that is much beyond wealth, money, security. Here the risk is extremely high and reward is sweet. It's purely based on value system that drives these empowered workers in doing what they love. With this, we are done with tertiary activities. We will now move on to quaternary activities. This is the fourth phase of a nation's economy. If you all remember, in the beginning I said tertiary and quaternary have a lot of similarities. And that's why this chapter uses both the terms together. Now both are part of service sector. But quaternary activities are those segment which are totally knowledge oriented. Have you ever heard of this term called KPO? That is knowledge processing outsourcing. What happens here is knowledge and information related work is carried out by workers in an organization. I'll give you an example of such companies. Deloitte, DE Shaw, Infosys, Genpak, Sutherland Global Services, etc. These companies generate product information and conducts research in order to benefit businesses. So what they do is they do market research that is what people are looking for and then create products accordingly. For example, Microsoft and Google, they give cloud services to major firms as per their requirements. So it's the job of KPO to gather and utilize the data for improving business needs. Since this kind of work involves research development, so knowledge and information related to this kind of work is usually carried out by highly skilled and specialized workers. So this was all about the quaternary activities. Now we move on to the last part that is quinary activities. So we have covered primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary activities. And we also know as we move from left to right, the skills and competence increases. Hence, it is obvious to understand that in quinary activities, the skills and competence is going to be of the highest level. We are talking about CEOs, managing directors, top level executives of company, government or industry. And their work is purely decision making. We also call them policy makers because they are the ones that know which switch needs to be adjusted to get a required outcome. Suppose a company is making profit in a year. The top executives decide whether they want to expand their business or not, whether to give bonuses or increment to their employees, or whether to hire more people. So this is what quinary activities is all about. The quinary sector is the top economic sector. I want you to quickly read this paragraph. There isn't much to discuss. So just quickly go through this section which tells us how medical services are being outsourced and their impacts. And the last topic of this chapter would be the digital divide. The term digital means modern technology and in technology we have both information as well as communication technology. Now technology is unevenly distributed across the globe. For example, the kind of technology USA has it takes quite a lot of time to come to India. And then there are some countries that will probably never get those kind of technology anytime in near future. It is due to economic, political and social differences among countries. And this is how countries become developed, developing and underdeveloped. This gap between countries in terms of technological development is what we mean as digital divide. Remember that. So I gave you an example between countries. Now this kind of digital divide exists within a country as well. You can see many parts in India are not developed compared to the big metropolitan cities. There are places where there is no basic services of electricity and drinking water. Forget about having access to internet connectivity. So this kind of differences between two places is due to digital divide. And with this, we have come to an end of this chapter. The question answers are available on the website. Check them out. And thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. If you enjoy these videos and see a purpose behind watching them, please like the video and comment down below. Until then, catch you guys later and talk to you guys on the next one. Peace.